Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about making your own tabletop games, uh, your own tabletop systems. Um, I've, I'm trying to cram a lot of information into this presentation, so I definitely recommend taking notes. Um, but we'll have some time at the end for questions, and then I'll, I'll hang around in the uh, the text chat after the end for a little bit to, to try and get more questions as well. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, so first up, if you're going to make your own tabletop RPG uh, or tabletop role-playing game, biggest thing I recommend is going out and playing other tabletop role-playing games. Um, so just like if uh, if you're an aspiring author uh, or you know someone like that, uh, you would go read a lot of books. <clears throat> Same thing with games. Um, so you, you'll definitely want to go uh, do that. So that's the first step, is you want to go out and play a lot of different games. For me, I played uh, a lot of Serenity RPG uh, way off in the beginning. Um, and uh, uh, obviously D&D, &D, that's the, the go-to. Um, and there, there's a lot you can learn from Dungeons & Dragons. Um, it's a very solid mechanics-based system. Um, so there's a lot of positive things that you can take from that, but I also recommend playing other systems like Powered by the Apocalypse uh, or Monster of the Week, which is based on the same thing. Um, uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, try out a bunch of games that have uh, different mechanic systems. So some of them will be D20 systems, some of them will be 2D6 or a D100. Um, there's tons of different varieties out there, and I definitely recommend sampling those as much as you can. Um, Second, decide what time of what type of game uh, you want to create. So there's generally three pillars of tabletop role-playing games uh, when it comes to the system uh, or the mechanics uh, or what you're trying to get across. Uh, the first one is role play, the second one is exploration, and the third one is combat. Um, and while it's generally ideal to have all three in your game, uh, it's not required, uh, and you can put more or less focus on one of those pillars as you like. Um, so before you start making the game, I recommend, uh, you know, sort of sitting down and deciding, do I want this to be a role play focused, uh, game? Do I want this to be a game that's more about exploration? Am I really focused on the combat? Um, and again, to give you some examples, uh, like Powered by the Apocalypse tends to be focused on role play and or exploration. Uh, D&D is very combat focused with much less focus on role play, uh, and a little bit on exploration. Um, Call of Cthulhu uh, and games like that are a lot about the exploration and the role play. Um, and uh, some systems even like that discourage uh, combat uh, by making it extremely difficult. Um, so kind of sit down and decide what do you want your game to be about? Um, and then once that's done, uh, pick a mechanic style. So you've, you've played a lot of different games. You've seen what it, there is out there. Uh, you've decided the type of, of game that you want to do. Pick a mechanic style, and that's um, uh, what I mean by that is, are, are you using a d20? Are you using d6? Are you not using dice at all? Because um, those are options as well. Um, there are RPGs out there that use cards as your prompting mechanic, uh, and others that are, are completely devoid of that and are essentially just collaborative storytelling uh, that's been gamified. Uh, so picking a mechanic style is important. So I mentioned a lot of other systems, such as my own. Uh, use a d20 based system um, and that just means that you roll a 20 sided die and you add uh, that to other numbers on your character sheet and uh, and then of course you know there's the 2d6 the the d12 systems the d100s just whatever you want to use that's probably the the most important part i think uh, when you're just starting out because that's going to form uh, the base for everything else that you do um, so once you've done that you can move on uh, to deciding if you want to make a system for telling stories or a story with a system to tell it. Uh, and what I mean for that, so to give you an example, my system, Fundamental RPG, uh, is a system for telling stories. I don't have any uh, lore or story behind it. I don't have an era that it's set in. It's strictly a uh, mechanical system that you can put your story on top of. Um, it's designed to support anything that you want to do with it. Um, so you can do, uh, you know, your classic high fantasy, like a D&D type setting, uh, all the way up to sci-fi and literally everything in between. Um, and that makes it very flexible, but it also means that you have to have your own story as a GM uh, that you're wanting to tell. Um, so you have to decide, do you want to have something like that? Or do you have a story or a world in mind and you just want a game uh, that allows you to play around in that world? Um, good example for that is D&D. Uh, D&D has a ton of lore. 
a ton of different uh, locations, characters, backgrounds. Um, it, it's all set in a high fantasy setting for the most part uh, as the default. Um, and uh, that means there's this, this huge lore library that GMs and players can pull from. Um, they don't really have to tell their own stories. They can just kind of uh, take whatever's there and play around with it. Um, that does also mean that it's very inflexible if you're trying to tell stories of your own that maybe don't quite fit that setting or uh, don't include some of those locations or characters. Um, you have to do a little bit more work to make it fit. Uh, so there's pros and cons to, to both sides of that. Um, and uh, it's really important to decide early on which of those two sides you want to go with. Um, you can do a little bit of a hybrid type situation. You can go story light uh, or, uh, or go with like a, a system that's just for mechanics and then have a story module that goes along with it. Um, so you can kind of separate them to make it very easy to uh, take the story or leave it. Um, but uh, yeah, just deciding what you want to do there is important, important early on in the planning. Um, and then once you've made all those decisions and you've put your rough draft together, um, you're going to want to play test it. Uh, and this is the step that is probably the most important step uh, in designing your own tabletop game that is often the most overlooked. Um, a lot of times people will, will put the system together. They'll spend a lot of time writing it, maybe a lot of time editing it even, um, and then only run like one or two quick games to play test it. Um, and play testing is, is really where you're able to refine it and polish it uh, and take it from uh, like a homebrew game, uh, which is a, a common term when you just um, you know, take an existing system and uh, you make a bunch of changes to kind of make it your own, and it's called homebrewing. Um, so you can take it from a homebrewed system to a professional uh, game all on its own. Um, so playtesting really cannot be overstated. Um, for Fundamental RPG, my own system, uh, in first edition, uh, I ran uh, a months-long campaign. It ran for about eight months, I think. Um, I did several one-shots, and I had a lot of friends run their own games. Uh, and through that, um, before I even uh, you know, put it out there available for purchase, uh, through that, I was able to find a lot of little things that were um, confusing to other people. Um, it made sense to me because I'm designing it, so I'm, I'm kind of, you know, my head's in the system already. Uh, but for somebody coming at it from a different perspective, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so that really helped me refine things, uh, trim out parts that were just kind of clunky and didn't need to be there, um, and figure out how to phrase things or, or put them in a certain order that made more sense to the GMs and the players. Um, for second edition, uh, which I've got coming out, <clears throat> um, at, uh, it'll either be at the end of this month uh, or the beginning of next month. Uh, I'll throw a link into chat for all of you if you want to take a look at it. Um, so for second edition there, uh, I did even more playtesting. Uh, I ran several campaigns on it. Um, I'm, I'm still running campaigns uh, on the playtest version um, just to make sure there's nothing else that I want to change before it actually goes out into print. Um, I also did a ton of one shots. I had multiple multiple people uh, test it for their own games. Um, for this one, I even reached out to people who I'm I'm not friends with, just other tabletop players that I know on Twitter uh, or that I've seen on Twitch. And I go, hey, would you like a free copy of this game uh, to play test it? I just need you to let me know what you think. Um, so I did a, a few things like that. Uh, and I also had beta readers that kind of went over it with a fine tooth comb and said, uh, this makes sense to me or I really don't understand this. Where were you going with it? Um, having all of those things is in incredibly important. I've been working on second edition for about a year. Um, and uh, that's a year of work for the second edition. So I already had the, the foundation of first edition done. And I still took another year to do the second edition um, before it ever hit print. Uh, the only people who have seen it, the only people who have played it, are those who have been playtesting with me uh, or um, select tiers on my Patreon uh, that, that get certain uh, early access to things. Um, so playtesting is extremely important. Um, 
and getting a lot of different people to play test it is also important. Once all that's done, uh, once you've you've done a lot of play testing and you're taking uh, all that analysis that you've received from uh, from your friends, your colleagues, other people that you've had test it, at that point you've really got to get into refining it, making those changes in the system and figuring out how that's going to affect things. One mistake that I've seen a lot of people make when they're designing a tabletop game or even just a module for a system that already exists uh, is playtesting it, getting feedback, and then being too afraid to change things to really fully implement that feedback. I've worked on a couple of different games where I've had this, this mechanic or this one little thing that I really, really liked. I put a ton of time and effort into it, uh, only to find at the end it just it really wasn't working. I've spent in the past too much time trying to make it work. And I've seen a lot of people spend entirely too much time trying to make it fit because you, you get attached to certain things about the game. Um, and uh, you often fall into the sort of fallacy of, uh, well, I've put all this work into it, so I can't afford to drop it. That's something that's really hard to let go and you kind of just have to. Uh, if you find a mechanic or a part of your game just isn't working, people don't understand it, uh, or it's making things too complicated, don't be afraid to just drop it entirely. Take it out of the game, try something different. If you know the way that you've allocated uh, attribute points or something like that just isn't working, don't be afraid to get rid of attribute points and try something else. Keep working at it, keep refining it, keep making changes, and remember that you can always change something back if it's not working. Um, when you're still in the playtesting phase. So don't be afraid to try different things. Don't be afraid to take things that you've spent a lot of time on and shelve it. Because that's the uh, the mindset that we tend to get into is I've, put, I've spent all this work on it. I've put all this effort into it. You know, I really don't want to get rid of it because I've, I've come too far to let it go. Keep in mind that the amount of time and effort and energy that you put into that has helped you learn. Uh, so that's something that you'll still be able to uh, apply those, those skills, that knowledge that you've, you've uh, gained. Apply that in other areas. And you can shelve that mechanic, and maybe it doesn't work for this game, but it might work for a different game that you make later down the line. Um, so don't ever get into the feeling of like, oh, I've spent all this effort on something and it just didn't work and it's just a failure. It's not. Anything that you're working on in a game that just doesn't make it into final print, uh, it's, it's never wasted time. It really does make you learn, and it's something that you could potentially use in the future. And then uh, the next point I wanted to to talk about was remembering to write in notes for GMs and players. Um, this is something I don't see nearly enough of, uh, especially in uh, in the larger games, um, but even in, in indie games, there's not a whole lot of it, is you're the game designer. You know that there's going to be GMs uh, or game masters and players that are going to be using this. Um, and you have the opportunity to say something directly to them. Uh, you can give them tips. Uh, you know, if you're designing a game, I, I, I would hope that you've GM'd it quite a bit uh, before putting it into print. So you can give GMs tips on how you like to use some of these mechanics. Um, you can put in optional rules. Uh, for second edition Fundamental RPG, I have a number of sections that says, hey, this is how we recommend it for the default setting. But, you know, if you're looking for a more challenging game, try this optional rule. Or if you find... Um, you know, that you want this to be more combat focused, or if you want to be a more role play focused, uh, try using this optional rule. Um, and you can, you can leave those notes in there. Uh, for, for fundamental, we're using uh, little purple boxes uh, that are sort of to the side um, so that the reader knows, hey, this is something uh, that's not part of the main uh, material, uh, but it's sort of a note uh, and it makes an optional rule uh, known there. And with that, just communicate to your, your GMs and your players that are going to be using the system. Uh, remind them to just make sure they're communicating all of this to their players. Because uh, as long as everybody's on the same page, it should be fine. Don't really have anything to worry about. But that is a, a really great way to differentiate your stuff from somebody else's, uh, is, is having those notes in there. But also a way to make it a lot more approachable, a lot more accessible uh, to GMs and players. Uh, especially people who are getting into tabletop for the first time. And it, it's really not hard to add those in. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort. Um, usually it doesn't add a whole lot of uh, page count to your book. So if you're worried about printing expenses or uh, if, if you have a formatter that's working for you and you're paying them by the page, um, you know it's not going to increase your expenses too much. 
um, but it is going to make your book look different. It also breaks up big blocks of text. So if you've got a page full of, uh, you know, just exposition about rules or uh, a setting or something like that, you can break that up with one of those little note boxes. Uh, and so it doesn't seem so overwhelming to the reader. Um, so that's a, a really great way that you can uh, do minimal effort to make a big difference in your book. Um, and then finally, um, don't rush yourself. Um, don't feel like you, you have to get this out by a certain date that's really soon, um, unless you are working with somebody or a company that is imposing that deadline, of course. Uh, but if you're self-publishing or if this is your first tabletop system, don't feel like you've got to get it out next month. Um, take your time and give you yourself the amount of time that you need to fully design it, fully think it through, fully play test it. Um, like I said, for a second edition fundamental, uh, the one that I've been working on the most recently, I've spent about a year play testing it and then taking those changes, uh, implementing them, play testing it again, getting more feedback, making more changes, play testing again. You can see the pattern here. Um, don't be afraid to take that time uh, and don't be afraid to talk about it with your friends, ask them to help you with it. Um, if you are a, a tabletop streamer or if you're heavily involved in tabletop communities on social media, um, uh, uh, forums or, or things like that, Twitter, um, don't be afraid to reach out to other people and say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this game. I'm looking for people to try it out. Would you be interested? Um, and, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get a lot of, uh, you know, no thanks, or sometimes you won't get a reply at all. Um, if you're sending DMs out on Twitter or something like that, um, and that's okay. Uh, a lot of these people don't have time to test everything or, or contribute. Um, but in my experience, generally the tabletop community online at large, there's a lot of people who do have time and are more than happy to help other people, uh, out with their games because they want to try new things. Um, so yeah, give yourself plenty of time and, uh, and play test, play test, play test. Uh, so quick review of what we've talked about so far before we go to questions. Uh, so first step to making your own tabletop is to go out and play a lot of other tabletop games. Go try a lot of different systems. Um, there's a ton of them online that are, that are free, uh, or pay what you want. Um, uh, itch.io has a ton of indie games on there that are that are really cheap or free. Um, and then, of course, there's you know the big ones out there like D and D uh, games that are from Modiphius, uh, or um, uh, another great one is Zweihander uh, that you can check out. Uh, that are all very different. Uh, second, decide what kind of game you want to create. So remember the three pillars, which are role play, exploration, and combat, and decide. Uh, which of those three you want to focus on, or do you want to take a more balanced approach to it, uh, or do you want to get rid of one of those pillars entirely? Um, don't be afraid to ignore one of them. Um, they're sort of there as a general rule, but uh, as long as you understand the importance of each one and what you want to bring across in your game, um, feel free to ignore the traditional rules and just do your own thing. Um, but do understand their importance before you do so. Uh, third is pick a mechanic style. Um, choose what type of dice you want to use as your main mechanic. Uh, do you want to use a d20, a d100? Uh, do you want to use 2d6? Um, uh, do you want to have attributes and skill points, or do you want to have it very simplistic? Um, and I, again, I highly recommend looking at a d100 system, a d20 system, and then something like Powered by the Apocalypse or Monster of the Week, uh, and compare those three, because that will give you a good idea of some of the... Uh, um, the word I'm looking for, um, sort of milestones, I guess you could say, that are out there. Um, fourth, decide if you're making a system to tell stories or a story with a system to tell it. Um, and that's a big difference. Um, again, using my own stuff as an example, fundamental RPG is a system to tell stories, uh, whereas something like D&D is a big world with a lot of story with a mechanic system behind it to tell it. Uh, fifth, once you've made all those decisions, you put your rough draft together, play test, play test, play test. Again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I cannot overstate the importance of play testing. Um, six, don't be afraid to make changes. Don't be afraid to drop things if they're not working. 
Um, don't beat yourself up if you spend a lot of time working on a mechanic and it just doesn't work out. You can always use it later. And the amount of work you've put into that, um, you've learned a lot from working on it. So don't feel like it's a waste of time. Um, seven, remember to write in notes for, for GMs and players. Uh, it's really, really useful. Um, I've personally very much appreciated it when tabletop books have those in there. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's something that you don't see all the time. So it's a great way to differentiate your system from somebody else's. Uh, and then finally, don't rush yourself. Um, give yourself plenty of time. Um, it's very easy, especially as an imp- independent creator, uh, to be really hard on yourself and impose deadlines uh, and really stress out about it. Um, imposter syndrome is also a thing that's very much uh, a problem. Um, and I could do a whole presentation on that. Uh, if you don't know what it is, I highly recommend looking it up uh, and coming up with ways to deal with it uh, because it can be rough. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I had for, for the main points um, for, uh, for the basics. Uh, I'm going to take some questions here in just a couple minutes. Um, but also, if you need help uh, or if you're looking for uh, consultation on, on these topics after the convention's over, those are services I do offer. Um, so you're more than welcome to contact me and, and ask me for help later. Um, and, uh, and I can talk to you more about that. Uh, I'll throw some links in the chat on how to contact me, check out my stuff, um, and look for examples there. Um, and yeah, I think that's pretty much all I've got here. So I, I definitely want to answer some questions, though. Um, so I will go ahead and let uh, let our producer here find some questions for us from chat uh, and go ahead and start answering those. All right. Thank you. Our first question is... And again, I'm just going to throw some of these links out in chat while we're waiting. Um, so right here's my link tree. It's uh, linktr.ee slash the R-A-V-V-Y-N. Uh, and that just has links to all of my stuff, my website, uh, social media, Twitch, where I stream uh, seven times a week uh, right now. Um, lots of really cool stuff there. Um, and then again, here's my uh, shop where you can find the pre-order for Fundamental RPG 2nd Edition. Um, it's right there. Lots of really cool stuff there as well. Okay. First and, question. Uh, yeah, any questions? Our first question is, if you're writing your own setting, either as homebrew or as your own tabletop RPG, how much background information do you need to uh, include? Well, for questions, other things that you can uh, decide on early on as well, especially if you're going for like a... Uh, uh, a story or a world setting with a mechanic system to back it up. Um, also choose what genre you want to be in. Um, so I mentioned my system is very flexible. You can do anything from high fantasy to sci-fi to anything in between. Um, but you don't necessarily have to be that flexible with yours. If you have a specific type of game that you want to do, um, that's also a good, good thing to choose early on. Do you want to be a sci-fi game? Do you want to be a high fantasy game? Um, you know, do you want to do steampunk stuff? Uh, whole tons of different settings. Um, tabletop games can really fit virtually anything. Um, in addition to Fundamental RPG, I've made a lot of smaller ones, um, one of which is called Rhythm and Blues, and it's all about um, getting a band together, uh, choosing what objectives you want to get. Do you need to get uh, equipment? Do you need to get a manager? Do you need to find a venue? Um, are you a new band getting together or are you trying to quote unquote, get the band back together to do one final show? Um, so you collectively do a lot of decision-making about the game, uh, before you even start playing. Um, and that's something that we call collaborative storytelling. Uh, it's very much more so focused on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it, it can pretty much fit any kind of band, but it's, it's very set in, you know, in modern time. Uh, with, with set objectives and things like that. Um, but it's a one-page RPG. It literally fits on one page. Uh, the system's super simple. It's 2d6. Uh, and depending on uh, what you roll, you get an either a uh, yes and uh, result or a yes but result. Um, and that just means that uh, you succeed and you, something else good happens. Or you succeed, but maybe something that you didn't intend to happen occurs. Uh, or it's not as effective as you wanted. 
Um, so that's a, an example of how you can do something really simple as well. Um, okay. Um, and then, yeah, any, any questions? All right. Our first question is, when getting your TTRPG published, is it better to go to a publisher or, or to try and self-publish or maybe go through Kickstarter? All right. It doesn't look like we've got any questions. Um, so, yeah, I can just take a, some time to go a little bit more in depth on some of these things that I talked about before. Um, so I mentioned the three pillars of tabletop RPGs, uh, one being role play, two being exploration, and three being combat. Uh, for the first one with role play, that's one that I like to focus a lot on. Um, I really enjoy the uh, the improv acting side of it, uh, which is especially useful for streaming. Uh, I mentioned I stream tabletop RPGs uh, seven times a week, uh, so I've got seven different shows, which means a lot of different characters. Um, and with a stream, it's for entertainment. Um, so co the combat pillar doesn't really lend itself super well to that. Um, we definitely still have combat in our games, but it's not something I like to focus on because you tend to have to focus on the numbers. You have to pause and figure out what you're going to do. Uh, whereas role play is really, really great for being on screen and having an audience. Um, so not only for, for my job of doing that, uh, but also just my own personal enjoyment, I really like focusing on that first pillar. Um, exploration, the second one, uh, is really great. It's one of the, uh, I think the best things about tabletop games is that you do have the freedom to explore everywhere, anywhere that you want to go. Um, if you look at video games, which are also you know super fun, um, but they do have very limited areas that you can go explore. I'm sure we've all had the experience of running into a quote unquote invisible wall uh, on a video game and seeing this thing way off in the distance that looks really cool, uh, but we can't actually go explore it because it's not actually there. Um, that's one of the nice things about tabletop games is that you're not limited by that. Anything that you can see or imagine you can go explore. Um, and there are a lot of games and a lot of systems that do focus on that. Um, and, uh, that's something else I, I also quite enjoy. Um, and a lot of the games that I run as a GM, uh, I will give my players that freedom to explore virtually anything that they want to. Um, I, I'm not a very linear game master. Uh, I, I've had games where I had characters who were uh, essentially sci-fi mercenaries. Uh, and one episode they decided, you know what, we don't want to be mercenaries this week. We want to we wanna go buy and sell cheese. And so for an episode, it ended up being like half an episode, but for half an episode, they, uh, they went and they bought a whole bunch of cheese and they ran around the, the galaxy being cheesemongers. Uh, and they went to places that they definitely would not have normally. Um, and that's all part of exploring in an RPG. Um, so there's definitely ways that you can focus on that um, by putting in mechanics that, that uh, encourage exploration. Um, you can set up something where you get more experience, uh, the more places you discover, uh, or things like that, or set up templates uh, so that... Um, uh, it's very easy for a game master to sort of throw together a new location without having to think about it or plan it out uh, a ton beforehand. Um, so that's the second pillar. And then the third one being combat. Um, that's where mechanics heavy stuff happens, typically. Um, you can, you absolutely can simplify it and just have it be an opposed role. Uh, you know, 2d6 or d20, whoever rolls higher gets the hit in. And then you've got weapons that uh, have a certain amount of hit die or uh, points for them. Uh, you can go super simple like that, or you can go complex like D and D, where you've got you know feats that tie into it. Uh, you've got attack range, um, different bonuses, uh, stats, things like that that all play into it. Uh, all the way to super complicated. Um, when, that's when you get to, into more like um, 40k and things like that, where uh, you've got you know multiple units that you're controlling uh, in combat and detailed grids and things like that. Um, the, the combat pillar of, of RPGs is, is quite varied. Um, but generally, you're going to be looking at more math, uh, more mechanics, more um, 
bonuses and buffs and and uh, and debuffs and penalties and things like that. Um, but yeah, all three are pretty important uh, to RPGs as a whole. But again, you don't have to have all three uh, be prominent in your game. You can ignore combat completely and still have a fantastic game. Uh, you can ignore exploration completely uh, and still have a pretty compelling game. Um, the only one I'd say that you can't generally ignore entirely is role play. Um, you're, you're still going to have a little bit of that no matter what, because you're playing these characters that are not you. Um, but uh, if your group or the, the uh, audience that you're really trying to appeal to is more, you know, I just want to crunch numbers and, uh, and, you know, beat stuff up and things like that. Um, you can definitely focus more on the combat and, and not have much RP in there at all. Um, it's really just a matter of preference. Um, but it is important to keep an eye on all three, uh, understand their importance, and then decide what your market is. Uh, who, who is going to be playing your game uh, and what are they going to want? Um, and then uh, going back to mechanic style, um, there's a lot to be said for a D20 system. It's something that uh, a lot of people are very familiar with. Uh, most people who are into tabletops have played D&D at one point. Um, D&D is very much so a sort of um, gateway to RPGs, if you will. Um, uh, it's definitely the most known, um, arguably the most popular, uh, and it brings a lot of people in. Uh, so if they started there, a D20 system is going to be very easy to understand. Uh, that's one of the reasons I went with it for my system. Um, is, uh, you know, people that have, have played D&D are very familiar with rolling a D20 and adding numbers to it. Uh, if you give them something similar, it's not going to be too hard to figure out how to play your game. Um, but even with that being said, D20 systems can be complicated even when you simplify it down. So if you go with something like Powered by the Apocalypse, which has a 2D6 system, uh, that can make things even easier to get into. Um, so the way, the way it works with Powered by the Apocalypse or Monster of the Week, um, generally, if you roll between a 1 and a 6, that is a failure. If it's a 7 to 9, that is a mixed success. Uh, or a 10 or higher is a full success. Um, and so you don't really have to worry about uh, adding a whole bunch of different numbers together. You do have certain stats. I think there's five of them, I want to say. Uh, just thinking off the top of my head. Um, and they'll add one or two or even three to that total number. Um, but that's really all the math you have to do. Uh, and uh, you know immediately when you roll whether you succeeded or not. Uh, unlike D&D or similar systems where um, the DC or difficulty check, which is the number you have to meet, uh, can vary depending on a lot of different factors. Um, so even though a lot of people will be very familiar with a D20 system, uh, it's not necessarily the easiest to pick up. Um, other systems that are less known are uh, D12 systems, um, Serenity RPG or Cortex, which is the system it's built on, uh, uses that. And essentially, you level up by uh, giving your uh, different attributes or your skills or whatever uh, die steps. Um, and so instead of rolling uh, just one particular die and adding something to it, the more you level up, the higher dice you roll. Um, so, for example, you could start with, say, a D4 in something or a four-sided dice. Uh, and as you level up, that goes up to a D6, D8, D10, so on and so forth. Um, and for Cortex, it stops at D12 and you start adding an extra die. So then it's D12 plus D2, D12 plus D4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's not a mechanic that you see a lot of out there. Uh, so if you are looking to be unique with your game, that's definitely an option that you can go with. Um, but uh, it is pretty fun. Um, I, I rather enjoyed it. It was one of the first tabletop games that I played, um, and I found the system to be very uh, unique and refreshing and, and not that confusing. Um, and then I mentioned also D100 systems. Uh, Zweihander, I mentioned them before. Um, that's a fantastic game and a really great company. Uh, the folks that run it are just fantastic humans. Um, but the game itself is pretty cool. Uh, uses a D100, and unlike a lot of other games, the goal is to get the lowest number. Um, so instead of having numbers that you add to the D100, uh, they are set numbers for your attributes, uh, and that's what you want to get below. 
So it's almost like your attributes are a difficulty check number or a DC rather than um, uh, you know, something that you, you add in. Uh, so for example, uh, you could have a stat, say, uh, toughness, for example, uh, and let's say your stat in that is a 45. You would roll a 100-sided die, um, and if you get below 45, then you succeed. If you get above 45, then you fail. Um, and if you've played a lot of D&D uh, before you play other systems like that, that can be really confusing. Uh, because the idea that a nat one is a critical success uh, is very much not how your mind's trained to work after playing uh, games where you want a higher number. Um, but it's still pretty interesting. Um, and it gives you a lot more uh, variety of, of results. Um, obviously, with a D100, you're looking at 1 through 100 versus 1 through 20. Uh, and so there's a lot more chances to succeed or fail. Um, and uh, I do tend to see a lot more uh, variety in successes and failures with a D100 system. Um, but that being said, there's also more numbers. Um, instead of only having to worry about 1 through 20, you're looking at 1 through 100, and your stats are looking like you know 30-something or 40-something. Um, and that can get a little overwhelming if you're not careful with it. Um, so uh, deciding what base mechanics you want early on, like I said, is, is pretty important. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of variety to choose from. Um, I also mentioned that you don't even have to have dice. Uh, I played a game not too terribly long ago called, uh, I think it was called Save the Queen. Um, and it was an absolute blast. There were no character sheets. There were no stats. There were no dice. Uh, you just got card prompts. Um, and early on, the cards kind of help you determine what your character is going to be like. Uh, you choose character traits and everything, uh, your appearance, things like that. Uh, and this is definitely one of those uh, only focusing on the role play pillar of, uh, of tabletop RPGs. Um, but as you drew cards, it gave you different prompts, different scenarios that would pop up. Uh, and then you reacted as your character to that. Um, and you sort of collaboratively uh, told a story about how you're escorting the queen somewhere and trying to keep her safe. Uh, and what your relationship to the queen is and to each other. Um, so you can definitely go with something like that where it's, it's cards that give you prompts. Um, I've heard of a, a whole bunch of different games with uh, pretty wild uh, mechanics in it where they've uh, not even had cards. Instead, it's, it's um, uh, various other things that will bring in like around the room um, or it'll be... Um, uh, they'll, they'll take turns kind of giving each other prompts. So you can see how tabletop games can go from virtually no mechanics to super heavy mechanics. Um, and there really is no right or wrong answer to that. Um, it just depends on who are you trying to get this game to appeal to, uh, who's, who in your mind is going to be playing your game, and what are they going to enjoy, um, and what kind of game do you want to make. Um, so yeah, there's more, more detailed information on those things. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to throw those in chat. I'm more than happy to answer uh, anything that you would like to ask. Um, so while our and questions there's are... anything else to really cover in more detail. Um, so I, I think I, I made it clear that playtesting is super important. Uh, I know it tends to sound like a broken record when I talk about that. Uh, so I, I won't um, bore you with that anymore. Um, but uh, I did mention choosing if you're making a system for telling stories or a story with a system to tell it. Um, if you are going to go with the latter, uh, if you're going to choose to tell a story uh, and then build your mechanics around it, uh, it's also important to think about what mechanics make sense for the story you're trying to tell. Um, that can be something that's uh, kind of e easily overlooked. Um, the best games that I've ever played uh, marry the mechanics in the story really, really well. Um, so don't look at them as two separate things. Um, look at them as complementary things. Um, so if you are uh, telling a story that has a lot of opportunities for character interactions, uh, a lot of opportunities for really in-depth character development, uh, or a super lore-rich environment where uh, people can explore 
uh, all these different locations that have uh, you know this, this massive history behind them that you've already written out and planned out, then putting a mechanic alongside that that is um, say very numbers crunchy, um, so it involves a, a lot of different skill points that you have to worry about and talents and feats um, and other buffs that you have to pick every level. Uh, things like that won't be as conducive to telling that story um, as those would be to say a very combat focused game. Um, so keep those things in mind as you are uh, as you are working through that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's about all I've got to talk about for this. Unless uh, again, unless anybody has any questions. So Raven. Um... One of the volunteers wanted me to ask you this question. You mentioned that sometimes with the lore in D and D, it makes it a bit rigid. When making your right, own well, setting, there's not any questions. Uh, just another reminder: uh, you can find me at my link tree, which I'll throw in chat again. Uh, just link tr.me/slash the Raven, and that's T H E R A V V Y N. Um, and if you are interested in checking out my system, um, Fundamental RPG, uh, I've got a copy of the book here. Um, the first edition uh, looks like this. And you can find this one on Amazon. Um, second edition, as I mentioned, I'm still, uh, still in production. Um, but pre-orders are available at my coffee shop, um, which is uh, still right there up, up in chat. Just uh, ko-fi.com slash r-a-v-v-y-n slash shop uh, and just look for the little dot at the top that says Fundamental RPG uh, you can pre-order that in PDF and paperback um, so obviously I do recommend uh, those as a, a great system but I am uh, admittedly biased for other systems to check out if you're interested in making RPGs uh, or just experiencing the wide variety of things um, I highly recommend Zweihander, and that's Z-W-E-I, Hander. Um, it is a D100 game. Uh, it's also fantasy, but it's a different kind of fantasy than D&D. Uh, it's a little, uh, I I'd say, grittier. Um, uh, their tagline is Grim and Perilous, um, but uh, it's definitely something to check out. They've got one of the more unique character creation systems I've seen out there, where you can actually roll on random tables to choose virtually everything about your character. Um, so if you do have trouble, or if you know people that have trouble putting characters together, that's, it's a really cool way to do it. Um, uh, again, the Cortex system, which has a lot of different sci-fi shows that have uh, adopted that from Firefly or Serenity to Battlestar Galactica. Um, it's a D12 system uh, with a lot of really interesting qualities to it. Um, and then uh, one of my other favorites is Powered by the Apocalypse or Monster of the Week. It's extremely easy to just grab and start telling a story um, because the mechanics are so simple. Uh, it's also pretty customizable. And that's a D6 system. 